وبعد. Continuing with that book, Umdat al Fiqh, uh, we've reached to the chapter where the Imam he talks about Kitab al Janaiz. Janaiz is the plural of Janaza. The word Janaza comes in two ways. It comes with the Fatha, Janaza, meaning the dead. And it comes with Jinaza, with a Kasra, meaning the thing upon which you carry the dead, the Na'ash. Okay, so with the Fatha, Janaza is the dead. With the Kasra, it's the thing upon which you carry uh, the body. So of course, the Janaza and the praying upon the dead is from the obligations that we owe to those who have passed away. And it's from the takrim of Bani Adam. It's from the honoring of Bani Adam. That in life, the son of Adam is honored. And even in death, the son of Adam is honored. So the Imam, he says, If it's become apparent and it's sure that the person has passed away, then you close the eyes of this person. So the first thing that Imam, he mentioned, he says, If it's become apparent and it's medically clarified it's medically uh, issued that he has passed away because sometimes we think or it can happen that you think that somebody has passed away but you find later that in matter of fact they didn't pass away it was something else so it needs to be medically proven that the person has actually passed away from the realm of this world and if that be the case then you close the eyes of the person because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith of Ibn Majah that when the person, when you come to him and he has passed away, then close the eyes of that person. Because verily the eyes of a dead person, when he's dying, follows the soul as the soul is leaving the body. Okay? So the, the eyes are fixated on the soul when it's leaving the body. We ask Allah Azawajal to give us a good end. Ameen. And also from the reasons of doing this, shutting the eyes of the person is that so when the family members want to see him after the ghusl has been done then he doesn't look so shocking he doesn't look so scary you can imagine a person has passed away and their eyes are wide open looks a lot more scarier and shocking than they would be if the eyes were closed the imam he says and his jaws are brought together tied together with something or they are just closed right to prevent anything from slipping into his mouth then the Imam he says, And then you place upon the stomach of this person something like a mirror or a piece of iron. Why is that the case, you think? Why may be that the case? To stop it from expanding and bloating, right? This is in the situation where the dead is in a hot country and the burial is going to be delayed. The sunnah for the burial is that it be rushed that the burial takes place quickly. But if it be a case that it's in a hot country and the burial is going to be delayed, then you need to do something like this to prevent the body from bloating. But of course, if you have access to the freezer system, that's better and that's what should be used if it needs to be delayed. The Imam, he says, That when you start to give ghusl to the dead, you have to ensure before you do so that the aura of the dead person is covered. Okay, that is from the honor to the dead. That his aura is covered in the dunya. We ensure that when he's passed away, or she has passed away, that the aura is also covered. So with regards to the washing of the dead, what is the ruling? The actual ruling, is it, what type of obligation is it? It's a fadl kifaya, right? It's a communal obligation. So if a group of people, they do that washing, then the sin or the obligation is removed from the whole community. If nobody does that washing, then the whole of the community is to blame. The whole of the community will carry the sin. So the Imam, he says, if you start to wash the dead person, then you have to ensure that the aura is covered. And then he says, ثُمَّ بَطْنَهُ أَسْرًا رَفِيقًا And then what you do is that you press upon the belly of this person, lightly and gently, but enough to ensure that whatever was in the stomach comes out. Okay, and when you do that, you try, you try to bring the body upwards to an angle of some sort. Okay, so that this will help whatever is in the stomach, the, the remnants to come out. And which hand would you use for the cleaning? You would use the left hand. So, 
pressing on the stomach and bringing the body up slightly when you do so, so that the filth or whatever remains in the stomach can come out. The Imam says, So when this comes out, you make sure that you have some type of cloth over your hands or gloves, even better, and you wipe away the filth that came out of the person. After wiping away the filth and washing that area where the filth came from, you make wudu for the person. Now what would be the difference here in the wudu that you do for the dead person? The water will not be put in the mouth, nor will it be put in the nose. Rather, the water will just be rubbed into the mouth and rubbed into the nose. Okay, you wouldn't put a handful of water into the mouth or into the nose of the dead person. So the Imam says, ثُمَّ يُوَضِّئُهُ After doing so, ثُمَّ يَغْسِلُ رَأْسَهُ وَلَحْيَتُهُ بِمَاءٍ وَسِدْرٍ After doing the wudu, you will wash the head and the bed of the person with water and sidr. Sidr is a mixture of a particular plant, okay, from the leaves of that plant. And if you cannot have the sidr, then soap suffices. So with water and sidr, and if sidr is not there, then you would use soap. You would wash the head and you would wash the bed. And this is based on the hadith where the sahabi, he fell off his camel and he broke his neck. So the Prophet said, اغسلوه بماء وصدر. Wash him and use water and sidr. Then the Imam says, ثم شقه الأيمن ثم الأيسر. So after you've washed his head and his beard, you start to wash his right hand side and then you start to wash the left hand side of this person. ثم يغسله كذلك مرة ثانية وثالثة. And then you wash him again a second time and a third time in the same way. The same way up to now what we've done apart from the wudu, you wash him again, okay? The second and the third time. This is based on the hadith of Umm Atiyah in Bukhari and Muslim when one of the daughters of the Prophet ﷺ passed away. The Prophet ﷺ said to her, uh, said to the women, اغسلناها ثلاثا أو خمسا أو إن أريتم أو أكثر من ذلك إن أريتنا ذلك. Wash her three or five times or do more than that if you feel that there is a need for you to do so. So the asal is that the minimum should be three times. Because the Prophet ﷺ, what did he start with in the hadith? اِقْسِلْنَهَا ثَلَاثَ مَرَّاتِ He said, wash her three times. Okay? So the best thing to do is that the minimum you have three times. But if every time you press the stomach and something comes out and you need to wash more, then make sure you stop on witr. So you go to five and you go to seven. Okay? You can go beyond that, but then the ulama, they say that we do what the imam he mentions next. يُمِرُّ فِي كُلِّ مَرَّةٍ يَدَهُ Every time you wash the person, you press the person's stomach, okay? Again. فَإِنْ خَرَّجَ مِنْهُ شَيْءٌ غَصَلَهُ Anything that comes out from the stomach, from that area, then you wash it again with water. وَسَدُّهُ بِقَطْنٍ And this is the part that I wanted to mention. So after you've reached seven, what you should do then is that the private area from where the filth is coming out, you should fill it with cotton, okay? So that nothing else then comes out after that. فَإِنْ لَمْ يَمْسْتَمْسِكْ فَبِطِينٍ حُرْ If that cotton doesn't remain in place, then you use clay, okay? So that the clay can actually block anything from coming out. وَيُعِيدُ وَضُوءَهُ And then you repeat the wudu. This is mustahab. To repeat the wudu here is mustahab, it's recommended, it's not a must. فَإِنْ لَمْ يَنْقَى بِثَلَاثْ زَادَ إِلَى خَمْسْ أَوْ إِلَى سَبْعَ So as we said, if the person is not washed, or purified with three, you can increase to five or you can increase to seven washings. Okay, but you should stop on what? You should stop on witr. Then the Imam, he says, And then what you should do after washing the dead, you should dry him. Why should you dry him? Because obviously you don't want his coffin, his shroud to be soaked in that water or in that mixture that was made for his washing. وَيَجْعَلُوا أَطِيبٍ فِي مَغَابِنِهِ وَمَوَاضِعِ سُجُودِهِ And then you get perfume at the end of the washing, okay? And you put it on the places where he used to make sujood on, okay? What are the places that you use for making sujood? The forehead and the nose and the knees and the hands and ahsanta, okay? These seven places as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, أُمِرْتُ أَنْ أَسْجُدَ عَلَى سَبْأَةِ عَظُمْ I was commanded to prostrate upon seven limbs and the rest of the hadith as you know. So as well as putting perfume on these places, you also put it on the places which are, as the Imam he said, 
the, the areas which are kind of hidden. So some people, they have a lot of flesh, okay? So for example, uh, where the, f the extra flesh is covering that part of the body, you would have to lift the flesh up and put the perfume there, okay? And also like under the armpits, on the back of the legs, these kind of places, right? The places that are generally hidden due to um, uh, the flesh being extra than it should be. وَإِن طُيِّبَهُ كُلَّهُ كَانَ حَسَنًا وَيُجَمِّرُوا أَكْفَانَهُ And the Imam says, but if you were to put the perfume on the whole of his body, then that's a good thing, okay? And you should make tajmir of his uh, burial shroud. Tajmir here means that, you know like the bukhur that they have in many of the Arab houses that lets off that nice smelling smoke, right? That's what you should do to the uh, shrouds before you wrap him up in it. You should put the bukhur onto the shroud that he's going to be put on. Some of the ulama, they mention that this person that you are washing and that you are about to uh, shroud, if he has gold teeth, then you can remove the gold teeth if it doesn't cause any harm to his jaw structure or to his teeth structure. You can remove the gold teeth. Why do you think they would say remove the gold teeth? That's the one. It's, it shouldn't be wasted. This is mal that the ummah can use, okay? The relatives can use it, or it can be given in sadaqah on his behalf, or anybody else who is in need can use it. So you see, even at the time of death, Islam is very careful about the usage of resources. So the ulama, they say that uh, that can be done. With regards to removing uh, any pubic hair that he had, if it's under the armpits, it should be removed, right? But obviously, if it's in the private area, it shouldn't be touched, it should be left alone because you're not allowed to look at the private area, therefore you wouldn't be able to remove it from the private area. So the Imam, he said to us, the last sentence, that if the whole of the body is perfumed, then that is well and good. And what you should do with the shrouds, you should uh, make tajmeer of it, you should make, put bakhur on the shrouds. وَإِن كَانَ شَارِبُهُ أَوْ أَدْفَارُهُ طَوِيلًا أُخِذَ مِنْهُ And if his nails are long, then you clip his nails. And if his moustache is long, then you trim the moustache, okay? If the nails are long, trim. If the moustache is long, trim. If the beard is long, leave, okay? Because this is something that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the person to be met with that. And the Imam, he says, وَلَا يُسَرِّحُ شَعْرَهُ And the person's hair is not to be combed. Why? Because it's likely to fall out, okay? That is damaging the body of the diseased. So the... The hair is not to be combed, but you could just run your fingers through it and you run your fingers through the bed to try to make it look tidy. The Imam, he says, That the woman, her hair is put into three plaits or braids and it's put behind her, from, to the back of her head, okay? The braids are made to drop from behind her, not in front of her. And the man, he is to be wrapped into three, in three cloths, okay, in three shrouds. He's not to be wearing a qamis, something which is like a long shirt, okay, nor an imama, nor a turban. Why they say this? Because they say when the Prophet ﷺ was buried, he wasn't wearing these, okay? He wasn't wearing the turban, nor was he wearing the qamis, okay? So the person should avoid doing so. But if he is buried for whatever reason in a turban and in a qamis, it doesn't affect the burial, burial in any way, shape or form, okay? So it's something which is recommended to avoid. It's not a must. So the man should be uh, buried in how many pieces of cloth? The imam, he tells us, three, right? And they shouldn't be the qamis or the imama. Yudraju fiha idrajan. Yudraju fiha idrajan, meaning that the wrapping of this cloth is done one after the other. So the body is placed upon three cloths, okay? Starting from the right, the uppermost, you would put over him. Then the left. Then the second under the uppermost, you put from the right, then the left and the one which is right at the bottom is the one that which would be done last okay so where do you start wrapping him from from the uppermost cloth okay out of the three from the right then the left then the right then the left then the right then the left when so the imam he says but if you were to put him in a qamis okay the long shirt and an izar the bottom wrapping the bottom cloth and uh 
any type of cloth after that, then that is okay to do so. Okay? It doesn't have to be in three shrouds like that. It can be the qamis, it can be the izar, and then it can be any cloth for him to be wrapped in, if that is available. The Imam says, The woman, she is put into how many cloths? Five. Why is the man in three cloths and the woman in five cloths? Because even in life, the, the sitr, the, the hijab of the woman, is more than the hijab of the man, right? The protection of the woman's aura is greater than the protection of the man's aura. So she is put into five cloths, five pieces of clothing. Fi dir'in. She's made to wear a dir. A dir is like a long uh, qamis, okay? A long shirt of some sort. Wa izarin. And the bottom wrapping, the izar. Wa miqna'atin, which is a khimar, which is a head covering, but not the long one, just one which covers the head, okay? Wa lifafatain. And then after that, two cloths which wrap her body so again a qamis okay a head covering the izar and then two cloths cloths which wrap her body so all of this is recommended the obligatory which must be done for both the man and the woman is that their aura must be covered even if that be with one piece of clothing okay everything i've mentioned up to now is recommended but the obligatory act which must be done for the man and the woman is that the aura must be covered. Because you can imagine in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu like Musab ibn Umayrin radiallahu anhu, this great companion when he died, they couldn't even find a cloth to cover his body. If they would move it down to his feet, okay, his top body would be exposed. If they would move it up a bit, the bottom half of his body would ex be exposed. So the point here is that as long as the aura is covered, then that is good. The Imam, he says, That the person who has the most right or should be put forth to do the ghusl for this person and to pray upon this person is the one that was mentioned in the wasiyah, the one that was mentioned in the will, if the person had the will. Because we should mention when we die who we wish to uh, do our ghusl and who we wish to take control of the affairs of our burial. And if there is no will, okay, then it will be the father, okay, and then it will be the grandfather, and then, then it will be the next in line of closeness in the relatives, okay? All of this is in situations where the family is kind of debating who should take over the washing and the burial of the dead, okay? So this tartib, this order that I just mentioned to you, it's in the situation where either the person is mentioned in the will, that I want this person to wash. If he's not there, I want this person to wash. Or the family is kind of arguing over who should do the washing. If none of that's there, then you can just give it to the local... Give it, astaghfirullah. You can uh, hand the body over to the local community service that carries out the funeral. That is well and good, okay? It doesn't have to be from a family member. <clears throat> The Imam, he says, النَّاسِ بِغَسْلِ الْمَرْأَةِ الْأُمْ ثُمَّ الْجَدَّةِ For the woman, the one who is first to wash her is the mother, then the grandmother. ثُمَّ الْأَقْرَبْ فَالْأَقْرَبْ مِنْ نِسَائِهَا Then those who come next in terms of closeness in relationship to the woman. إِلَّا So all of what we mentioned in terms of who should be doing the washing, if the Amir of the locality if the leader of the locality is there or the leader of the country is there at that funeral, then he is the one who takes precedence over everybody else. Okay? He is the one who takes precedence over everybody else if he is present. If he doesn't wish to do it, then we go back to what we mentioned beforehand. Now the Imam, he says, وَصَلَاتُ alayhi." Now he goes into the actual prayer of the janazah upon the dead person. And praying the janazah upon the dead person has a huge reward. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith of Bukhari, مَنْ شَهِدَ الْجَنَازَةَ حَتَّى يُسَلِّ عَلَيْهَا كَانَ لَهُ قِرَاطٍ وَمَنْ شَهِدَهَا حَتَّى تُدْفَنْ كَانَ لَهُ قِرَاطٍ أَصْغَرُهُمَا مِثْلُ أُهُدْ The Prophet ﷺ said that whoever witnesses the funeral until it is prayed upon, then he has the reward of a qirat. And the one who witnesses the funeral until it is buried, then he has the reward of qiratan, two of these things. And the Prophet ﷺ said the smallest amount of this reward is like the size of the Mount Uhud. And you know the Mount Uhud is a range of mountains. So just by praying upon the person 
and watching the funeral until it is buried, you have this huge, huge reward as well as you are fulfilling a right that your brother Muslim or sister Muslim has upon you. So the Imam, he says, the first thing that you do, you kabbir. That the Imam, when he's praying upon the dead, before we do that, where does the Imam stand? Uh -huh. And if it's, the, uh, if it's the woman, where should he stand? He should stand to the middle. If it's the man, he will stand at the head. Okay? So the, our Imam, he said, you kabbir. He makes takbir of al ihram What comes before takbir of al ihram That he must have. The intention, okay? So after having the intention, he makes the takbir, and then the Imam, he says, ثُمَّ يَقْرَأُ الْفَاتِحَةَ Then he recites Surah Al-Fatiha, okay? ثُمَّ يُكَبِّرُ وَيُصَلِّ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. Then he makes another takbir, the second takbir, and he makes salah upon the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Now the salah upon the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, you don't have to do, you don't have to do that which you do in your prayer. It doesn't have to be the long durood al-Ibrahimiyya. It doesn't have to be the long one. Any salah that you would say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, anything of this sort would suffice. Okay, but the best and the most complete is that which you do in your tashahud in the salah. Thumma yukabbiru wa yaqul. And then the third takbir, you make the takbir and you make the dua for the dead, which is Allahumma qfilli hayyina wa mayyitina wa shahidina wa gaibina wa kabirina wa sagirina ila akhirihi. The long dua that is found in the books of Sunan to make for the dead. Now, if you cannot memorize this dua, which is fairly long, you can say any dua, okay? You could say any dua. The simplest of them being, Allahumma qfillahu warhamhu. Oh Allah, forgive him and have mercy upon him, okay? The point is that when you make dua for this person, what is the most important point? The most important point is that you have sincerity and you're concentrating and you really feel sorry for this person. So when you're making that dua, you really feel that this person is in need of my dua. So you will make it with so much concentration. That's why the Prophet said in the hadith in Abi Dawood, Okay, if you pray upon the dead, then ensure that your dua for this person is sincere because he is in the most need of it now. Now is the time when he's going to face a whole new reality. May Allah give us a good end. Now is the time when he's going to be questioned in a few moments. Now's the time he's going to be all alone. All that's left with him now is his deeds and the darkness of his grave. So your dua, if it's sincere and your dua, if it's powerful enough, it can help him to have peace in the barzakh that he's going to face. So the Imam, he says, ثُمَّ يُكَبِّرُوا وَيُسَلِّمْ تَسْلِيمَةً وَاحِدًا أَنْ يَمِينِهِ And then you make the fourth takbir and after doing the fourth takbir, you make the sleem upon the right. You make the sleem where? Upon the right of yourself. And as you were praying and you made those four, th four takbirs, you raise your hands with every one of them, as was reported by Ibn Umar that the Prophet ﷺ would do so in the salah and collected by Imam Bukhari. The Imam, he says, min dalik The obligatory, he means the arkan, the rukan, the pillars of the prayer from that are, first of all, the takbirat. The saying Allahu Akbar. Those are the first things which are obligatory. Then the qira'a. What is the qira'a here? Surah Al-Fatiha. Okay? Then salah upon Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then making salah upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then the fourth thing is adna dua lil mayyit. Making dua for the mayyit and then making the salam to the right. Okay? These are the pillars of the salah. The Imam says, وَمَنْ فَاتَتْهُ الصَّلَاءَ عَلَيْهِ صَلَّى عَلَى الْقَبْرِ إِلَى شَهْرِ Whoever missed out on the funeral prayer of his relative or the person that he was close to, then he can go to the grave of this person and he can pray at the grave for up to a month. So you missed the janazah, you can still go to the graveyard of this person where the person is buried and for up to a month you can pray upon this person. And it doesn't matter if it's a few days over a month. وَإِن كَانَ الْمَيِّدْ غَائِبًا عَنِ الْبَلَدْ صُلِّيَ عَلَيْهِ بِالنِّيَّةِ Okay, if the person is not present in the land and he's in another land, then you can pray upon that person. So the ulama, they make some conditions here, many of them. They say this is a person if there wasn't enough Muslims to pray upon him or this is a person who has a very special status amongst the Muslims, then for this type of person, this 
janaza al ghaib should be done for him okay the salah uh, for this person because he's not in the country it should be done for him even in his absence even the, even due to the fact that he's out of the country tayyib the imam he says waman ta'adhara ghasluhu li adam al ma if it be a situation that you cannot make ghusl for a person due to the fact that you do not have water so the first excuse for not making ghusl for this person is that you do not have water. This is the first excuse, okay? Then the Imam, he says, Or you fear that if you make ghusl for this person, his body will start to fall apart. Parts of his body will start to fall apart. Like the one who had smallpox, okay? It destroyed his body. His body became very soft and full of pus. That if you start to wash it, Parts of his body will start to break up. Okay, so either you didn't have water or something will happen to the body, like he has smallpox, or a lot of his body has been burnt in a fire. Another reason you may not use water is because maybe there is a dead man and there's nobody from amongst the men there to wash him. It's only that there are women left in the village or in the town. The men may have gone out to fight battle or something, okay? Or it may be the case, أو أرجل بين النساء. Or it may be the case that there is a woman left between the between the men. Okay, there's no other women to wash. So what do you do in this situation? فإنه يمم. In this situation, تيمم is made for the person. And when you make تيمم for the opposite gender, you have to ensure that you have some kind of covering on your hands. So the Imam, he's saying that there is an exception to the ghusl. The exception is that number one, you don't have water. Number two, if there's some harm that which befall the body because it was burnt or it had some kind of disease. Number three is if that it's a woman that is amongst men that are all ajanib, they're not related to her. Or a man that is amongst women that are all ajnabiya, okay? They're not related to him. So in this situation, tayammam should be made for that person. The Imam, he says, in illa. He said, each of the, um, the husband and the wife, they can wash their spouse. So the woman can wash her husband and the husband can wash the wife. Okay? And this is collected or the proof of this is in the hadith where Hakim in his mustadraq he narrates that Ali radiyallahu anha gave ghusl to Fatima radiyallahu anha. Okay? So some of the ulama, they object to this. For example, Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy upon him, he said that the man should not wash the woman. The woman can wash the man, but the man should not wash the woman. Why? He said, and it's quite interesting, his fiqh. He said that from the moment the wife passes away, the man can now go and marry four women. He can have four wives, right? If he was to be able to wash the wife that passed away, how many wives would he have? He would have five because he's still allowed to see her aura. He's still allowed to touch her. So we, Imam Abu Hanifa is saying this cannot make sense. He said, so the, from the moment that she dies, the man is now allowed and nobody says he can't. He's now allowed to go and marry four women. He can take four wives. And then if he goes to wash the wife that passed away, then it means that he has five wives. Why? Because he's touching the aura of that woman. Okay, so this cannot be the case. So the minute she passes away, according to Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala, that he then cannot wash the woman. But the opposite, he says, is okay. That the woman, if her husband passes away, she can wash him. Why? Because she can't get married, right? She has to go through the idda period. So it says, though she still has that relationship of husband and wife with, uh, with the husband. But as we said, the majority, they say there's no problem for either spouse to wash either person because Ali radiallahu anha washed Fatima May Allah have mercy upon them both. The Imam, he says, coming to the end, وَالشَّهِيدُ إِذَا مَاتَ فِي الْمَعْرِكَ لَمْ يُغَسَّلْ وَلَمْ يُصَلِّ عَلَيْهِ The Shaheed, who's the Shaheed? The one who dies in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? But they say here, the Shaheed is the one who dies in the Ma'rika, in the battlefield itself. So he actually dies on the battlefield due to a wound or due to being killed directly on the battlefield. Not somebody who, for example, receives a wound on the battlefield, but then is taken off the battlefield to a hospital or somewhere else and dies there. That is not considered as the shaheed in this chapter of fiqh. Okay? He's still a shaheed, but not the shaheed that we're talking about here. 
The shaheed that we're talking about here is the one that actually dies on the battlefield, okay? إِذَا مَاتَ فِي مَعْرِكَ لَمْ يُغَسَلْ وَلَمْ يُصَلِّ عَلَيْهِ He's not to be given ghusl and nor is he prayed upon. Why? The Prophet Sallallahu said in Bukhari and Muslim, إِنَّهُ يَبْعَثُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَلَوْنْ لَوْنُ الدَّمْ وَرِيح رِيحُ الْمِسْكِ That this person will be brought forth on the day of judgment and the color of his blood will be of pure blood and the smell coming from his body will be a smell of misk. So that should not be washed away. It will be an honor for him on the day of judgment that everybody will be looking to him and they will recognize that this person was one who sacrificed himself for the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that, that honor should not be taken away from him. It should not be washed from him. He should not be given with ghusl. Rather, he's to be buried in the clothes that he died in. Why is it that the salah should not be made upon him? The janazah should not be made upon him? He's already forgiven. And even greater than that, salat al janazah is an intercession, right? We all need that intercession of the believers. But he's the one who's making intercession for, for his family. He's the one who's making intercession for 70 members of his family. And like the brother said, Abu Isa, he's already forgiven his sins from the moment his first, uh, the first prick of the weapon uh, touches his body. And you know the shaheed, when the thing touches his body that is killing him, whether it be a bullet or a spear, it's just like a prick. SubhanAllah. <laughs> he doesn't feel the pain. He feels just the prick of that bullet or the prick of that spear. Then the Imam, he says, So the Imam, he says that the shaheed, this one that we've mentioned, that his armor is taken off him, okay, and he's to be buried in the clothes that in which he died. And if he is buried in other than those clothes, then that's all well and good. It doesn't uh, affect his situation in any way, shape or form. The Imam he says, well, muhrimu The one who is muhrim on Hajj in the state of Ihram, he is to be washed with water and sidr. Okay? And he's not to be buried in any stitched clothing. Mukhit, stitched clothing. Okay? And no perfume is to be put on him. And his head is not to be covered. Nor his feet to be covered. وَلَا يُقْتَعُوا شَعْرَهُ وَلَا ذُفْرَهُ And nor is his hair to be cut, nor are his nails to be cut. So the muhrim, he has a different set of rules as to everybody else apart from the shaheed. Okay? The imam, he says, وَيُسْتَحَبُّ دَفْنُ الْمَيِّتْ فِي لَهْدٍ وَيُنْسَبُ عَلَيْهِ لَبْنُ نَصْبًا It's recommended for the person when he is buried that he's not put in a shiq. Shiq is that once the grave is dug, a further space is dug in the middle of that grave where the person is buried. The luhud is that to the side of the grave, uh, an apartment is made, a space is made where the person is going to be put in. Okay, the dead is going to be put in there. And then you would put slabs of concrete along that space that you made where the person is buried. May Allah give us a good end. Amen. So it's recommended that the person is buried in that way. كَمَا فُئِلَ بِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَلَا يُدْخِلُوا القبر آجرا ولا خشبا. Baked clay should not be put into the grave, nor wood. ولا شيء مسّت النار. And nor anything which has been touched by fire. Why? This is تفاؤل, uh, optimism that he will not be touched by fire. So anything that is touched by fire, like baked clay or anything, anything of that sort, you don't put it in the grave. تفاؤل, having optimism that the fire will not touch this person. And Allah knows best. The Imam he says, well, يُسْتَحَبُّ تَعْزِيَةُ أَهْلِ الْمَيْتِ And it's recommended that you make ta'ziyah to the family of the dead. What is ta'ziyah? Ta'ziyah is condolences. But this condolence, it doesn't mean that you gather in a place to give condolences like in tents, etc. like people do today. Because the companions, radiallahu anhum, they wouldn't gather for this. They wouldn't gather and make a big festival out of the death of a person. If they would meet somebody in the street, or if they would be close to somebody, they would go and visit that person. But it wouldn't be a big issue where they would set up a tent or they would hire out a very expensive hall and they would have a banquet and they would go and meet that person. Many of the ulama today though, however, they allow it. How can it be the case that they allow it? What they say is, look, there's a difference. He, they say in the past, the towns and the cities were very small. People would bump into each other often. Now it's the case that you may not see your brother for two to three months. 
because everyone's so wide apart and everyone's so busy. So if you do it in today's situation, they say it's okay, but it shouldn't be done out of extravagance and out of showing off. Okay, if it's done like you just come to somebody's house to pay condolence, then that is well and good. So when you go to pay condolence, you should remind the person that everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything has to return to Allah azawajal. There's absolutely nothing that can get in the way of that. The death had to happen and you remind the person to have patience and remind the person to continue with dua and to continue with good deeds for the sake of the person that has passed away. And it shouldn't be made into a major, uh, you know, a major burden upon the family that has died. Many a time, the family that has died is suffering with this calamity, yet they still have to cook food for the visitors that keep coming. This is wrong. If visitors are going to come, they are the ones who should be, should be taking the food. Not the family of the dead should not be making the food. They are already in a state of calamity. The Imam, he says, it's not disliked for you to cry if that, doesn't, if that is not accompanied by nad or niyaha. Nadb and niyaha is to wail over the dead and to lament. You need to mention that this person was such an amazing person. Why did he have to die? You know, this person did so much good. Why did he have to die? Not that type of wailing is allowed. The Prophet said in Bukhari, Inna Allah la yu'adhibu bi dam al-ayn wa la bi husn al-qalb wa lakin yu'adhibu, yu'adhibu bi hadha wa ashara ila lisanihi. The Prophet said, Allah does not punish due to the tears of the eyes. Nor does he punish due to the sadness of the heart, but he punishes due to the behavior of the tongue. So the tongue should be controlled. The Imam he says, "Wala ba's bi ziyarat al qubur lrijal," and it's permissible for the men to visit the qabr, to visit the grave, because the Prophet ﷺ said in Tirmidhi, "Inni kuntu nahiyukum an ziyarat al qubur, fazuruha fa innaha tu dakkirukum al akhirah." Verily, I used to prohibit you from visiting the graves that was in the early time of Islam. Okay, and after Tawheed had been established in the hearts, the Prophet ﷺ said, go ahead and visit the graves, for verily they remind you of the hereafter. What did he say? What was that key point he said? They remind you of the hereafter. So that is one of the most important objectives of going to the grave. Apart from fulfilling the right and, and giving mercy to your brother or sister, is to remind yourself of the hereafter. Today, at the funerals, you find people, they're on their phone texting. You find people are smiling and laughing. You find people are having a conversation. This is hard to fathom. You're going there to remind yourself of death. You're going there to remind yourself that in the next few seconds, in the next few minutes, I am going to be in that situation. So we shouldn't be in a state of happiness and joy. In fact, Imam Qurtubi in his book, at tadkirah he said to his brothers, he said, I advise you to go, and re- to go and visit the graves because it reminds you of death. But he said, do not go with a full stomach because you won't be able to take benefit. Look how they thought of these acts. He said, don't fill your stomach before you go because you won't be able to take the spiritual benefit. So going to the grave is for spiritual benefit, both for the dead and for the living. The person, when he goes to the grave, he says, or he goes to the graveyard, he says, Salamun alaykum dara qawmin mu'mineen wa inna insha'Allahu bikum lahiqoon. Allahumma la tahrimna ajrahum wa la taftinna ba'dahum. This is one of the du'as that should be said if you are going to visit the graves. The Imam, he says, He said, any good deed which is then done on behalf of the dead person will benefit that person. Any good deed that you do whatsoever which is sanctioned by Islam if you make the intention that the thawab is given to this person, that the thawab will reach that person. So give me an example of that. Sadaqah, what else? Hajj, what else? Huh? Fasting, what else? Reading Quran, what else? Establishing some, we already said sadaqah, right? Any good that you are going to do, if you make the intention that it should go to the dead also, it can go to the dead according to many of the ulama. Okay? Other from the ulama, they limited to a certain amount of deeds. But to let you know the opinion of Imam Ahmad and Ibn Taymiyyah was, any deed that you do with the intention of the thawab going to the dead, it will go to the dead. But we have to make sure that the deed is not done in an innovative way. So what is one of the innovative deeds that take place, which in essence is permissible, but due to the innovative way, it's impermissible. 
Very good. So that's one of them. People gather in some communities and they make dhikr on a certain amount of beads and they put it into a bowl. Do they cook those beans after that? It's beans. Is it not? Is it just beads? Oh, I've seen some which are dates. I've seen some which are beans. And what else do they do? They gather. To, they gather to read the Quran. Okay. They gather at the time of the death, soon after it, and annually, every every year that has passed, as on the on the date of the person's death to commemorate, they gather and they read the Quran. All of this is an innovative act. If you were to do it individually, or to remind people that they should be doing it, that is well and good. And the food. What about the food? The food, like we said, right? If the family, they, they have passed away, you don't want to be cooked. They shouldn't be cooking food for the visitors or going to the masjids and giving out food. Rather, the community should be cooking food for them. But again, like we said, we don't want to make the death ceremonies something which is big and over-exaggerated. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We ask Allah azza wa jal that he benefits from that which the Imam taught us. And any mistakes and shortcomings for myself and shaitan. Anything which was correct from us, Allah Azza wa Jal. If you have any corrections or questions, then feel free. So, ladies visiting the Qabr is makruh, is disliked, okay? Highly disliked. And difference of opinion is there. But we can't say it's forbidden. Tayyib, Jazakumullah khair. May Allah Azza wa Jal reward you.